On April 15, 1989, a routine soccer match in Sheffield, England became one of the most notorious disasters in sports history. What started as a typical Saturday afternoon ended in an unprecedented tragedy. Thousands of eager fans entered Hillsborough Stadium that day, expecting a thrilling FA Cup semi-final match. Instead, they faced a fatal catastrophe that shook the United Kingdom to its core. The match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest was set to kick off at 3 p.m. Excited fans made their way to Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield, England, expecting a fun outing on what turned out to be a bright and sunny afternoon. As they arrived, they were met with a fairly standard arrangement. The opposing fan bases were each segregated into separate sections to avoid conflict between them. Nottingham Forest would be situated in the South Stands and the Spion Cop to the east, Liverpool fans in stands to the north and west sides. As part of the segregation policy to keep opposing fans from having direct access to each other, they had to use separate entrances. The access point assigned to Liverpool fans would be the entrance on the west end of the stadium at Leppings Lane. This entrance featured 23 turnstiles for the nearly 25,000 fans, only about a third of the turnstiles that were offered to those entering on the other side of the stadium. Ten of those turnstiles were allocated for access to the north stand, and six to the upper tiers of the west stand. Finally, in a smaller area off to the side, there were seven turnstiles allocated for entrance into the pens on the lower level of the west side. The pens, seven in total, were standing room only. Each of them had been fenced in to prevent supporters from invading the pitch. Over 10,000 Liverpool fans purchased tickets for the pens, all of whom would have to pass through one of those seven turnstiles at Leppings Lane. With thousands of people all needing to enter this narrow passage in a relatively short time, it created perfect conditions for a bottleneck. By 2 p.m., things had gone fairly smoothly. About 2,000 spectators had entered the pens, but as the match drew nearer, fans began arriving in droves. Between 2.15 and 2.30, the size of the crowd exploded. Progress through the turnstiles was tediously slow. The crowding was compounded by fans being refused entry and those mistakenly attempting to enter in the wrong turnstiles. Those fans could not proceed forward, but the crowd was too compacted for them to go back. They simply became obstacles for others trying to enter. By quarter to three, facing the possibility of missing the game's opening minutes, fans were becoming restless. The crowd began constricting, funneling toward the sole means of access. People at the front were being pressed tightly against the turnstiles, which did nothing but slow progress. A police constable radioed into the control booth inside the stadium to request the game be delayed 20 minutes to allow additional time for the fans on the outside to make it in safely. In the booth were Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield, who was the match commander for the game that day, and Superintendent Bernard Murray. They briefly discussed the idea of postponing the game, but ultimately decided against it. The constable's request was denied, even though the same accommodations were made the year prior in 1988 for what would have been the prequel to this game, same teams, same venue, same stakes. At 2.52 p.m., in a rash attempt to control the crowd, Duckenfield gave the order to open Exit Gate C to provide an additional means of entry. The gate was just around the side of the turnstiles and provided a way to completely circumvent them. This decision would prove to be a grave mistake, opening the proverbial floodgates into disaster. The 5,000 remaining fans swarmed through the open gate into the narrow corridor, which led directly into the central pens, pens 3 and 4. They quickly became overloaded. The only way to alleviate the overcrowding would have been to spread the fans into the other pens to each side of the central pens. However, the only entry into the additional pens were through narrow doors at the rear, which became essentially inaccessible due to the large influx of bodies. The crush was becoming more serious by the minute as more fans tried to pile in. By the time the match kicked off at 3 p.m., the situation was dire. Even by this point, most people not directly involved in the ongoing crush were completely unaware that it was happening. A minute and a half into the game, Liverpool's Peter Beardsley hit the crossbar while attempting a goal. 
Bruce Grobelar, Liverpool's goalkeeper, who was playing the goal at the Leppings Lane end of the pitch, would later recall the horrific scene in an interview. We hit the crossbar, so there was a great roar and then there was a surge. They came up the field, the ball went into their pen and as I went to get the ball, you saw the faces against the fence and people saying to me, Bruce, can you help us? Please, they're killing us. And I'm thinking, well, who? Then, when I picked the ball up, I realized. The roaring of the fans in response to the gameplay had triggered more people to surge into the pens to see what was going on. The ongoing catastrophe could no longer be ignored. They had broken through multiple crush barriers, thus pushing the entire crowd of people forward into a dead end with extreme force. Those at the front of the crowd were being violently pressed into the front of the pens, unable to move, unable to breathe. The pressure on the people within the crowd was fatally intense. So much so that many ended up dying while standing up from a condition called compressive asphyxia, which occurs when the pressure on one's torso is so great, the lungs are unable to expand, similar to how a boa constrictor kills its prey. Fans started climbing out of the pens into the upper stands and over to the pitch to escape the unfolding horror. At first, officials thought it was an attempted pitch invasion and tried to dissuade the fans entering the pitch before realizing the magnitude of the situation at hand. Supporters in the upper stand helped by pulling members of the crowd up to safety. As soon as trapped fans managed to escape onto the field, they put their fears behind them and turned around to help their fellow people. Bruce Grobelar, recognizing the situation, asked the person near the gate to open it, but they didn't have the key. At 3.05, just five minutes after the match started, South Yorkshire Police Superintendent Roger Greenwood rushed onto the field and told the referee to halt the game. The players were ushered back into their dressing rooms. At first, they announced that there would be just a 30-minute postponement of the game, but this was before the full scale of the disaster was known. Naturally, the game was eventually called off entirely. At 3.06 p.m., the first emergency call was made from the stadium, reporting a major incident. The South Yorkshire Metropolitan Ambulance Services was alerted, and the emergency response went underway. Following protocol, the ambulance is queued outside the gymnasium. The agreed-upon process for removing injured from the stadium in the event of a disaster was for the ambulances to wait in the designated area, known as a Casualty Reception Point, or CRP, while victims were brought to them by police and paramedics. To enact this procedure, however, a formal declaration is required from those in charge inside the stadium. This declaration was not made. This led to confusion and delays in treating the injured, as there was no central point for coordinating the medical response. As a result of not following the procedure, the CRP, instead of being an efficient means of egress for the injured, became a bottleneck of emergency vehicles. Of the 42 ambulances that arrived on scene, only three eventually made it onto the pitch. Due to the lack of direction, the emergency medical responders were unsure how to proceed. Some waited in their vehicles sticking to the CRP agreement. Others went into the stadium, some with medical equipment, some without. Fans inside were creating makeshift stretchers from advertising hoardings to assist the critically injured. Despite the lack of organization, the paramedics and ambulance staff worked tirelessly to treat the injured. They performed CPR, administered oxygen, and did their best to comfort and reassure the victims all the while being completely overwhelmed by the sheer number of injured and casualties. In all, 97 people lost their lives as a result of this tragedy, among them men, women, and children. It is the deadliest sporting-related disaster in England's history. Of those individuals, 30 of them were still outside the turnstiles at 2.52 p.m. when the questionable decision to open Gate C was made. Their lives were prematurely ended a mere 10 minutes later. The number of deaths attributed to this disaster is often cited at 96. That's because the final victim, Andrew Devine, who suffered irreversible brain damage in the crush, tragically passing away from his resulting condition in 2021. 766 people were non-fatally injured and over 300 were hospitalized. Support and condolences poured in from leaders around the world, including the Queen, Pope John Paul II, and U.S. President George H.W. Bush. 
A disaster appeal fund was created to assist the victims and their families. When the fund closed in 1990, it had received more than 12 million pounds, receiving donations from heartwarmingly many sources, including individuals, schools, other football clubs, the UK government, and the cities of Sheffield, Liverpool, and Nottingham. Despite the crush being directly attributable to negligence, the survivors and families of the victims had a long fight for justice ahead of them. Initially, the police flat out lied about what happened and stooped so low as to smear the character of fans in order to redirect blame for the incident. The police stated that fans had forced the gate open and rushed in. Guiding the media narrative, the police held steady that it was not their fault. Media outlets disparaging fans became ubiquitous, shamelessly slandering those who had gone through severe, unimaginable trauma. Victims were being called drunk and ticketless in the media. The Sun notoriously released a paper, baselessly accusing the fans of pickpocketing the deceased victims, urinating on cops, and beating up a police constable trying to give the kiss of life. While it was he who was largely responsible for the lies told to the media, and dodging accountability, the disaster can be largely linked to Chief Superintendent Duckenfield being ill-suited to be the match commander for such a large event. Brian Mole, on the other hand, who had been the match commander at Hillsborough for several years, was highly experienced in managing football matches. He had overseen numerous matches at Hillsborough, including several FA Cup semifinals, and was well versed in the complexities of crowd control at large-scale events. However, in March of 1989, just a few weeks before the FA Cup semi-final match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest, Mole was transferred from his position. The transfer was part of a broader reshuffle within the South Yorkshire Police Department. It was brought about because six months earlier in 1988, a probationary police constable in Mole's division was handcuffed, stripped, and photographed by fellow officers in a fake armed robbery as a so-called hazing prank. Mole was subsequently moved to the Barnsley District of South Yorkshire Police, leaving a vacancy for the position of match commander at Hillsborough, a position that would be filled by Duckenfield, who, despite having over 25 years of police service, had no experience in managing a football crowd of such a large scale. Nevertheless, he was put in charge of the match. The decision to appoint Duckenfield, given his lack of specific experience, would later become a point of significant controversy in the aftermath of the disaster. Following the tragedy, an inquiry was held by Lord Justice Taylor between May 15th and June 29th that year. His final report concluded that the main reason for the disaster was a failure of police control, and he concluded that neither the fans nor the ambulance services bared any blame. Specifically, it was pointed out that there were no police appointed to guide the flow of the crowd into the empty spaces as there should have been, even though smaller crushes had previously occurred at the very stadium. So the risk of such an event should have been considered. This oversight led to 3,000 supporters being able to crowd into the pens, even though the safe capacity for them was less than 1,700. Taylor's report led to sweeping changes, lateral fencing was removed, and most stadiums were converted to all-seater arrangements, eliminating all standing room. Despite the blame, police received no disciplinary action. This is largely due to the controversial decision made by Dr. Stephen Popper, the coroner in charge of the coroner's inquest. He asserted that, because of the nature of the event, any evidence admitted after 3.15 p.m. on the day of the disaster, a mere nine minutes after the game was stopped, should be inadmissible. His highly flawed reasoning was that, by this point, the principal cause of the death, the crush, had ended, implying that there was no one that could have been saved after that point. This is known to be false, as several of the victims were believed to be alive beyond that point, but it exonerated police because it ignored the implications of their role in the botching of the emergency response. The inquest returned a ruling of accidental death for all victims. Families of the victims were angered by the ruling. They fought for years to overturn this verdict, frequently to no avail. That is, until 2009, when the Hillsborough Independent Panel was initiated by the British government to investigate the Hillsborough disaster. It resulted in the granting of a second coroner's inquisition, which, after years of review, overturned the earlier ruling of accidental death. 
Six men, including Duckenfield, were charged with crimes including manslaughter. However, all but one of them would either be acquitted or have all their charges dropped, including Duckenfield. The sole person found guilty, Graham Mackerel, who was secretary of the Sheffield Wednesday Football Club at the time of the disaster, received a fine of £6,500 for a safety violation. Every year on April 15th, annual memorial ceremonies are held at Anfield and a church in Liverpool, with special events held for anniversary milestones. There are also more than a dozen memorials in Liverpool and Sheffield. The loss of 97 lives, the grief of their families, and the enduring quest for justice serve as a stark reminder of the importance of safety, transparency, and accountability. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this short documentary, please like the video and subscribe to my channel to help it grow. Until next time.